Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we have even more news on Warhammer the Old World today, this time focusing around a Old World Almanac, a designer roundtable on the new law and how it was written, which is actually fairly exciting. It's a pretty large article, I've been able to read that whilst I've been in the hospital waiting for... A conversation with my doctor which could have easily been a phone call let's just put it that way but um, <laughs> let's begin because there's a lot to talk about so the info dump is as a Q&A section so let's talk about this how does the narrative of Warhammer the Old World drive its setting the developer here Jonathan says Warhammer the Old World is an origin story for the apocalypse Across the decades of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, we covered the reign of Karl Franz, the rise of Archeon, and ultimately the end times. From the moment we established what the Empire was and what Chaos was, we destined Archeon to ascend and destroy the setting. Fairly certain that that's not actually the case, and it would have probably been carrying on if we didn't have a certain boogeyman in charge of Games Workshop back in the day, but yeah, okay. Ultimately, this is what happens because this is the established canon and so on, but uh, yeah. So this has continued, it's just split up by artwork, which we're not really going to discuss because it's old art, but yeah, let's jump into here. An early question for us was, what was the Horus Heresy moment in the Old World? What was the Siege of Terror moment? The conclusion we came to was that the destruction of Prague and the Siege of Kislev were pivotal. The rise of Asavar Kul represented the true return of Chaos to the Old World. So, yeah, we knew that this was going to be happening anyway because we know the start date. This is actually even explained down there. But this is a big thing because, again, very big character. We know lore about this. It's just it was never fully fleshed out. So, let's continue. Ever since the days of Sigmar, mighty champions of chaos have risen every few centuries to claim the title of Everchosen and lead grand incursions from the northern wastes to further the power of chaos. The Everchosen prior to Kul was possessed by Belakor and destroyed, so he didn't achieve what the ruinous powers had hoped. Okay, Belakor still remaining in canon. I was kind of worried that they were going to remove him or just like not acknowledge him whatsoever, so that's actually really, really nice which left Chaos with weakened influence in the years that followed. It's Asavar Kul who rises up and destroys Prague, bringing Chaos back into the world. He's defeated at Kislev, spoilers, um, <laughs> but while the nations of the Old World think that means Chaos has been driven back, the reality is that it's a tipping point. Something has changed in the world, and from that point on, it is doomed. Okay, yeah, fair play. This is actually a good point. Um, it's one of the reasons why demons aren't really in the playable books and they're just a PDF thing. Chaos has been waning for a while and it's not that active. It's still there, but something like Asavar is going to be a big thing. I wonder, I don't know if it's going to be stated here, but I'm just going to make a prediction. If it all begins with Asavar going into Cafe, because we know about this, uh, a little bit of an invasion was launched into Cafe and then pushing down to Kislev instead, if that's going to be some whole story point. But yeah, let's continue. So how intimate are these events? The date on the rule books is 2276. That's just a few decades before the Great War Against Chaos really kicks on. 2276 is specifically the year when Cetra invades the Border Princes, which is a huge moment for the setting. So you won't see the Siege of Prague anytime soon, but the wheels have been set in motion. Okay, so that means that we're going to start seeing new lore as time progresses. The reason why this is actually important is because... Well, uh, when it came to Warhammer Fantasy, the lore just kind of stayed stagnant. I mean, if you, you look at like 6th to 8th edition, we basically just repeated Storm of Chaos, but just with a worse ending. And uh, the lore never progressed too much for Warhammer Fantasy, which was always a big issue. It's the same thing that happened with uh, 40k a long time back. So it's nice to see that we're going to get progression of story, very similar to what's happening with the Horus Heresy. And, well, pretty much all the other mainline settings... Uh, so let's continue here. How much of the setting was created especially for Warhammer the Old World and how much of it was already established in past books? Jonathan, while I don't think anyone had specifically planned for a game set in this period, there's really little that we've revealed in previous articles that wasn't already there. When we looked at the factions we're focusing on, it all quite uh, fits quite organically. The Skaven on around this time in the established background. They're fighting a civil war in the bowels of the earth, which causes them to practically vanish for a few centuries and become folklore. Yeah, it's a, a situation which ends up with the Skaven um, 
basically almost destroying themselves. There's a few events of that. Uh, eventually they do pop up. It's actually a few years down the line from where we are, actually, where they'll start launching a plague onto Bretonia, which is more or less around the time that Nurgle also does some stuff in Bretonia and the Black Grail stuff. Look, it's just never a good time to be in Bretonia. Right? I mean, you've got the Beastmen stuff, and yeah, it's just not fun. <laughs> Alright, it's continued down here. The major vampire count leaders aren't around either, because the Von Karsteins have just been defeated at Helfen, as much as it's possible for a vampire to be defeated. All this was there, and it all ties in with what we wanted to do. Possibly better than we could have ever hoped. Okay. Another dev uh, chimes in. So there were some excellent foundations for us to build the next leg on the journey of the journey on. There's still enough space for us to explore, and our long-term aim is to discover this setting through developing model ranges, which we do a lot of, and creating army books, campaign books, and more. We are treating it as a whole playground of time that we can explore. We might do some stuff that sequentially we might hop around? Huh? But our plan isn't to start at the beginning and work our way step by step to the victory against Asavar Kor. Wow, okay, so does this mean that we're going to get, like, campaign books set around different points of the timeline? That is absolutely incredible. I mean, that's what I'm reading, and if that's the case... We could potentially see, I don't know, a War of the Beard timeline campaign book. Uh, we could potentially see, oh, my big hope is if we can just go forward in time and finish the Tamacon series, you know, the Throne of Chaos stuff. That would be incredible. Oh, my God. This, if I'm actually interpreting it correctly, is wonderful. Either way, this is flat-out confirmation that we're getting campaign books, and that to me is an important thing, because uh, I'd like to see more stuff in general. It means that we're going to be getting more support, and obviously, as a Warhammer Fantasy fan, you know, that's the golden word for us, because we've been ignored for a while. But let's continue to the next section. Will any characters be returning, or is the chance of new uh, for new heroes and villains to be written? There are a number of familiar characters around in this era, but some of them may not be seen because they're not relevant to the story we're telling and the areas where the primary conflicts are taking place. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Focusing on what's immediately relevant for the Tomb King, Cetra the Imperishable, is back. Yep, in Bretonia, the Green Knight is also present. That's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, both of them very key characters for the lore of their respective races. So, yep, super happy about that. Let's continue. They are two examples of characters who have been around for hundreds or thousands of years. So, naturally, they've been around in this period, too. When we get back to when we get to future books, you'll start to see other characters you recognize returning, but at a younger age, kings, maybe princes. Oh, this is simple enough to actually figure out. This is stuff like Fogrim. Fogrim's alive during this period, uh, but he's just uh, he's just young. So yeah, super cool. And obviously, uh, 25 years before the Great War, we'll probably get maybe an introduction to a very young Magnus the Pious, which would be kind of interesting. But yeah, overall, that's super, super interesting. Let's continue. There'll definitely be characters people recognize, especially those who are longer lived. Ooh. Yeah, so chaos characters, demons maybe, hopefully in the future. Um, but yeah. But this is also a great chance for us to introduce new timeline-appropriate characters. As an example, none of the characters uh, from the Empire who are alive in the era of Karl Franz will be turning up. Yeah, it makes sense, as they won't have been yet born. Magnus the Pious isn't a featured character just yet. Oh, great. I mean, I, I really want to paint him. Like, I hope he looks like his old lore. Uh, like, they, we've got some art there. The monocle is just funny, right? But we might see heroes who are just as important introduced into the fiction and tabletop. So, law and models. Beautiful. Beautiful. The big thing is just the just yet, right? The just is in italics there. I'm really happy about that. Uh, there will be characters in this era whose deeds or failures have a knock-on effect leading on to the end times, as well as ancestors or other relatives or predecessors of characters you know and love from Warhammer Fantasy Battle. That means those older characters are relevant anyway, without us needing to simply revisit that character a second time. Okay. In the Empire background especially, there are loads of family names that have been dropped in, which 
we, in which we think people will be excited by. If you've been following the maps, we've been doing from the beginning, there are a lot of hooks there. Okay, so they're already hinting at a lot of characters. This, I believe, we discussed when the first map started appearing. But let's continue here. This is from Holly now. Uh, there are a lot of nods to things there and plenty of Easter eggs. Veteran Warhammer fans... Uh, those who have been, uh, who have read rule books and novels going back 20, 30 years, that's me, uh, <laughs> will uh, recognize bits here and there, as well as ideas first seen in various editions of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Oh, wow, okay, so they're going into, wow, awesome. Well, that kind of explains a little bit, right, because we haven't been seeing anything from Cubicle 7 in a while, so, eh, yeah, that could actually be linked up. Those books are a major reason why the world is so fleshed out and have been worked on by so many people from inside the studio. All right, let's jump into this section here. Is there anything that's drastically different about the world in this era? Technology won't be hugely different. A few things may be missing and other things will be treated experimental in the time uh, the game is set in, but you'll still get cannons and mortars. Yeah, I don't know why people kept thinking that we weren't going to get gunpowder weapons and so on, right? Like... We were going to the Great War. We know about gun lines and stuff there too. And uh, the message here from Rob is, another way to look at it, instead of what won't exist, is what technologies might exist during this time that have been forgotten or cast aside later on. And what does this tell us about the world of legend versus the world of the end times? Okay. Pretty curious. So we might get some stuff that was just forgotten and lost. Uh, very curious, actually. <laughs> All right, this section, starting off with Jonathan. As for how things change over time, look at Empire handguns. We could give Soldiers of the Empire all the standard handguns with more primitive firing mechanisms, but they function pretty much identically in-game. So we didn't do that because we want people to be able to get their old armies out, use them, and expand upon them without having to worry that such models are anachronistic. So this is the reason why we're getting some of the older miniatures back, which I'm perfectly fine on because, again... Uh, I like my stuff looking uniform, um, I don't know about you guys, but if we would have had like really old timey guns, I would have felt the need to buy a bunch more handgunners and so on. When I have a hundred, like I seriously have a hundred, well that's not true, it's the same kit as the crossbow, so I've got 50 and 50, but yeah, you get what I mean, right? Uh, it just makes sense, use the old stuff, I mean that's how the law always kind of showed it too. But yeah, let's continue. Rob says over here, in terms of magic, the Colleges of Magic will not feature because the Colleges did not exist at this point. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the Celestial Hurricaneum and the Luminarch of Hish uh, will, won't be there either. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, I know, I know, I know. Some people uh, are going to be quite sad about them. Yeah, and it makes sense because law-wise they didn't exist just yet because uh, they were created during the Colleges of Magic, which actually is explained here by Jonathan, uh, their creations of the Colleges of Magic. So they wouldn't exist at this point in time. You might be surprised at some things that do exist at this time, though, which is cool, and they go into Steam Tanks. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I do wonder if they're going to change around the lore a little bit, maybe to have them introduced in a campaign pack. Because uh, they're really pretty miniatures, that's pretty much it. They are just really pretty. But yeah, one of the interesting things we came across during our research uh, was lore from the end times about a specific steam tank used by Null called Deliverance, which, de which was deployed during the Siege of Prague. Steam tanks are fascinating because they were built several centuries ago when the great engineer Leonardo de Mirigliano was still alive. They've been around a long time and there's actually more in the world of legend period then during the enzymes, because they were newer and had and fewer had been destroyed. Okay, this is slightly more golden age, an age that knows a degree of peace compared to the end times. Oh, that's true. Well, barring the uh, Great War itself, which was absolutely gigantic. But okay, there's going to be more than just 12 steam tanks. Cool. I mean, kind of made sense anyway. Um, it's really odd. From a technical point of view, I know that they tried to make it really mysterious. I just don't understand why they couldn't replicate steam tanks in like the more uh, later periods when they literally had mechanical horses and shit like that, right? And, <laughs> and Luminarchs and all this. And it's like, oh no, this steam tank, you know, it's too difficult. I mean, the dwarfs, for example, make freaking, you know, bombers and stuff. All right, let's uh, carry on. An interesting difference here is, in this time frame, steam tanks are no longer a relic to be revered and studied. They were the shiny new product. They were less disconnected from the inventor and their contemporaries too. There's also less superstition. By the end times, it was commonly claimed that there were only 12 tanks built ever. 
But that's the kind of mad myth that spread in the end times. Really, there were loads of them. That was just normal. Oh, this isn't an, uh, an age of vast crowds wandering through the Empire and flagellating themselves. Some do that. Some definitely, but there are fewer than them. Far fewer. Okay, I mean, having a lot more is going to be interesting. Leonardo is definitely alive during this point. I do remember there was an old miniature for him too. My god. I wonder if they're going to use that. <laughs> It was like an old, uh, derpy metal model. I mean, if he gets a model, I, I really hope it's it's resin, at least, right? Uh, like, Forge World resin, not Filecast. Let's continue. Tomb Kings are listed among the forces of evil. Was that always the case? Okay, that's uh, talking about the drama recently. Cetra's understanding of his realm is that all lands beyond his borders are lands to be conquered by Cetra and to submit to his glorious rule. And his rule is absolute and unchallengeable. If you don't want to be ruled by him, he will kill you. Uh, those are the two options. Bend the knee or die. Okay. Fell. Uh, <laughs> that's the Tomb Kings down to a T. There was a period in later Warhammer Fantasy Battle where morality got a little more grey. But this isn't the world of the end times or the world that was. This is the world of legends. It's where they're born and come to life. We've tried to draw a clearer divide between good and evil and the armies of good are very much protectors of order. Right, so what I want to know uh, before we continue to read that stuff is what's going to happen with the Tomb Kings that we know that are genuinely good. There were a few that did actually oppose um, Cetra, and I'm not saying that they're good, King Far is one of them, uh, but there were others who did have like mortal descendants of theirs still alive around those areas, unless that's getting retconned or what's going on with that. I'd love to know what the process is, and hopefully these, uh, I think they're called Arcane Journals, will have all the lore that we are pretty much waiting for. Alright, let's continue. We're not trying to say that there's no shades of grey within this binary split, but that split is far more well defined now. Okay, okay, that's fair. It's difficult to buy the idea that an undying empire of skeletons ruled over by the ultimate tyrant who in his life wanted to cross every horizon and subjugate everything he discovered, wouldn't be evil. Eh, okay. The mortuary cults and the entire idea of undeath exist because Cetra's vanity and refusal to die. Fair play. Nagash wouldn't exist if it weren't for Cetra's refusal to die. Again, fair play. The aggrandizement of self through the grand statuary and hieroglyphic writings of Nehakara. It's so self-centered and so selfish and tells us so much about how little the rulers of Nehakara cared about their subjects that it can't be anything but evil. Okay, again, some older lore did suggest that we did have some of the Tomb King's areas, which I'm not sure if it was King Far of Nomas or it was probably Zendri, but one of them... Uh, the human descendants and so on did kind of survive. Those were there in other locations when Nagash did his curse and apparently now live among that. That might be lost, I guess, which is a bit of a shame because it would be nice to humanize some of the Tomb Kings a little bit. Let's continue with uh, Rob here. We've tried to capitalize on that with Nikaf's Cetra's Herald. He has this huge scroll that he brings out ahead of the army. Before they arrive, he's screeching all of Cetra's thousands of titles and epits. Okay, yeah, fair, fair. That list takes two hours or more to read out. And we've got a little bit of it in one of the sidebars in the Tomb Kings of Khemri Arcane Journal. See, that's a shame. That's a missed opportunity. They should have had one whole page of this uh, Arcane Journal with literally just Cetra's titles. Nothing else, just literally titles. Um, <laughs> let's continue though. Uh, Dan says, even that's a non-exhaustive list. In life, Cetra was a tyrannical monarch, and when he realized he was going to die before he conquered the world, he was so angry as to be inconsolable. Yeah, we know this, this is all the law. So it's good to see that's still there. When he realized that there would be land that would lay unconquered before he could reach immortality, it was more than he could bear, which in... All the law, I think it was suggested it was the Darklands that he m realized it wouldn't be able to take over. But let's continue. In the end time, Cetra opposed chaos because he was not going to yield to chaos. He's too insane even in undeath. That's why, that's where we think the idea of the Tomb Kings being good came from. And where we think the Shades of Grey perhaps muddied things a little too much. Neither chaos nor Cetra will let people of the old world get on with their lives. Uh, no, though, because you're looking towards the end times rule set, but in other editions, like, for example, early 8th, 
They were listed as neutral, not because they were good guys or bad guys or anything, it's because they kind of fell on their own alignment without allying with other factions and so on. It's something which was, I mean, in the rule books, right? Like, literally in the rule books. Nobody saw them ever as good, they just saw them as their own things. They're willing to kill chaos, destruction, undeath, and uh, living, order, whatever you want to call them, as much as they're willing to kill themselves. But... Yeah, let's continue. The Kingdom of Bretonia seems as much as it was. Are there any major changes? Rob. For Bretonia, the same classic symbolism and thematics that you'll remember are still in use, but the main things that have changed visually is the way heraldry is presented, which shows a different side of Bretonia from the chromatic parade you might be familiar with. Jonathan. In the old days, Bretonian armies were presented with mixed and matched heraldry, which tied to other ideas that every single knight of the realm had their own independent castle and they all came uh, from over the dukedoms to join battles together. What we wanted to do was consolidate how the Bretonians worked a little bit. A Bretonian army where every model wore different personal heraldry was really a uh, was a really aspirational image that you'd see in White Dwarf and army books but as a hobby project it was easy to run out of steam on. God damn it, yes. This is why uh, when the whole dukedom thing was revealed I'd been painting like proper heraldry and uniform dudes rather than this because it was it was just way way too much uh <laughs> it was way too much we didn't want to remove heraldry so we refought things a little we settled on the idea that most knights of the realm including pegasus knights would act as the retinue of a greater lord and wear their colors much like the lowborn men at arms they may have their own land, their own servants, and their own responsibilities, but they'll also spend a lot of time at court as professional soldiers and courtiers, which adds a sense of verisimilitude as to uh, how the kingdoms operate. Okay, yeah, fair play, fair play. I mean, it does, it definitely does look better, and it's definitely easier, and you can still paint in the other styles and the older style, uh, but for those like myself who have a lot of models, you know, it's just easier, way easier. Right, we're on the last part here by uh, Holly. Uh, we used that as a chance to analyze how heraldry works, how over time it will shift and change, and major and minor elements will get updates. Ah, oh, interesting. Sometimes minor elements may be em emphasized more for a reason, or a major element diminishes and colors change. Yeah, so like stuff like um, the Black Grail is going to change the colors of Musulon, I guess? And through these changes, you can tell the story of what's happened. In part, we are reverse engineering from the heraldry of the end times to where we are now. Why is there so much emphasis on end times, end times, end times, when this was stuff that was established since, like, 6th edition? This is when Bretonia um, was brought in, same thing. I think the Tomb Kings were brought in in 6th also, or was it 5th? But you know what I mean, right? Like, it wasn't end times law, it was Warhammer Fantasy Battles law. End times actually changed a lot of stuff in terms of law. Uh, let's continue. Rob, some of these ideas were picked up by the heavy metal team. The high-ranking knights will wear colors that are consistent with their duke's heraldry. But where there are tilting shields or similar features, the team took the time to paint those in a manner which reflected their personal heraldry. Okay. Okay, Jonathan here. This all works really well for when you're building armies. Knights of the Realm are relatively humble, but you progress upwards to questing Knights of Grail Knights, who are more individual and have more prominent personal heraldry. If you still want to use the classic mixed heraldry, there's nothing stopping you. There you go. There will even be rules for crusading armies when knights uh, from across the kingdom come together to undertake Grand Crusade that is reefed in color and pageantry. Perfect, you know? That's something that I want to do. Uh, we know that there's three rule sets, basically, for uh, Bretonia. We've got the standard dukedoms, the crusaders, and then obviously the exile knights. And I eventually want to have three different armies, all three different stylings, but it's all a matter of time here. All right, in this section here, we've got Dan. Uh, with every faction, we're continuing to adhere to the foundational elements established in the written law over the years. Bretonian knights aren't going to start carrying a gun. That's dishonorable warfare. That's true. Okay, that's cool. Uh, what's really interesting, and this is one thing that's always kind of thrown me off with uh, with Bretonians, is that they still kind of use gunpowder when it comes to, like, you know, their navies and so on. But yeah, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when it pops up in the law, right? Uh, we do explore the idea of outcasts and exiled Bretonian knights, however, they might be willing to bend the rules of chivalry a little bit more. Okay, I mean, we know bombards are back, so that's a thing, right? Uh, then Rob here, uh, 
Even though we're drawing on the ideas we established in early editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, Exile Bretonians can call on Bombards, oh there you go, and Black Powder, but it's still not the knights that fire them. Okay, cool. And uh, though their honor couldn't really be more tarnished, they are knights who've gone into exile of their own volition and because they won't apologize for wrongdoing. They won't take a quest or do penance, so instead they take their whole family and loyal serfs and go live somewhere else because they still believe they are right. Okay, wow, that's really stubborn. Maybe I am a Bretonian. Yeah. <laughs> The unique insanity of Bretonia is that everyone starts saying, well, isn't that noble to sacrifice so much? It becomes an honorable act. Oh god, yeah, that's more of a, I guess, oxymoron, I guess? I don't know. Even though their honor is besmirched, at some point they may be able to come back. But in the intervening time, of course, they'll justify using cannons and reinforce their armies with murderers and ruffians. So it's not really <laughs> a reason to go back this is warhammer law this is like proper warhammer law by the way so like um it kind of fits with the theme but it's still really odd uh but yeah that's cool and apparently tomorrow we're getting some information about uh design both on the miniatures and the graphics that's super cool so it looks like we're going to be getting a lot of information until the sixth that's incredible this has definitely been super interesting to read. I can't wait to see what uh, we're going to find out over the next few days. I imagine that they're just going to keep throwing out like daily articles and so on, which is going to be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, goddamn, this is amazing. Let me know what you guys think about all this in the comments below. Start a bit of a discussion. I'm liking this. This is it's just becoming so real now, isn't it? It's just becoming so real. Have a good day, guys. <laughs>